A while back, I remember watching a show, Primeval. It was streaming on YouTube at the time. I remember that I liked it. It had dinosaurs and other paleo creatures. Also, Tim Haynes, the creator of Walking with Dinosaurs, was a producer, giving some legitimacy to these admittedly exaggerated paleo animals. Now, I've recently rewatched it, seasons one through five, and wow, it's kind of bad. A lot to unpack. Now, an obvious retort is that I'm not really the target audience. It's clearly meant to be a lighthearted show, which you're not supposed to take seriously. And really, I get that. This is just fun exorcism. And a good place to start is the premise. Now, what sells the show is the animals from the past and future. Now, as far as how they get into this modern time, wormholes appearing at random. And with that comes a lot of questions. Quick side note, in the show they are primarily referred to as anomalies, because they are rare and it sounds cooler. Honestly, there's no reason why they are called that, especially since there's already a scientific established word for these things. They also constantly refer to animals that come out as creatures, because ooh, are creatures scary? But they are just animals. You don't hear of the creatures of the zoo, again, with the have cooler names. Like imagine having a procedural show where the robberies are called tickenings, or the zombies are called walkers. Ooh. Yeah, I know nitpicky. Just speaking with honest language. Anyway, as far as the dynamics of the anomalies, fuck it, wormholes, a Pandora's box of questions are opened up. Like, they are supposed to open up to places within space and time, as stated as part of one of the catchphrases. However, they only ever open up to places in Earth's timeline, which happens to have animals of note. And even more frustratingly, they never seem to appear anywhere outside the England area, unless we're counting the American-centered spin-off in America. Haven't seen it, not counting as part of review. Also, these wormholes are laughably customized for the animal. Big for big, small for small, sky for sky, and water for water. Like, it could have honestly been funny to have wormholes which open up to an incompatible environment, or one where it's a big creature and a little wormhole. I'm imagining something where they'd end up getting repelled like a magnet when too big. There was the point where the raptor got sliced up when it was halfway through. Also, bigger question. Forget the animals that come out. Shouldn't a bigger concern being the theoretical that follows these wormholes? Like, if it would lead to some sort of environmental displacement. We had taste of it earlier on with changes in water temperature and sulfur fumes. But all those were mainly just catalysts for the animals. As a matter of fact, shouldn't there be worry of if these holes in space and time lead to something like a black hole? All these are questions I have about the wormholes. And what's even more worrying than that is why none of the characters in the show seem to be asking these kinds of questions. They're all basic questions relating to the simple nature of wormholes, and you'd imagine, knowing the possibility of threat, they'd come up. Now, obviously, due to the dynamics of the wormholes, they are always going to be asking questions of us, but there is ways to minimize it, like establishing a reason to why it opens so specifically, like gravity concentrations or something. We could have a team be experienced, used to these and all, wormholes. They could easily ditch the whole time traveling idea and have the animals grow from a lab, like them dino chickens. However, with the team they have set up, they don't end up alleviating the issue with wormholes, Rather, they just end up causing more questions. Next is the breakdown of the characters. Obviously, the animals are the selling point. I'll get to them. But better to start with the people due to having a greater through line throughout the series. Something to note is that the team from the beginning is not the same as the team from the end, with the cast constantly shifting, making a bit of a mouthful to talk about all the characters, but I'll do my best. Now, something apparent with the team, especially early on, is that they are insanely unprofessional especially if in the midst of a scientific phenomenon. What we have, a professor, his lab technician, a nerd student, and a zookeeper, with later on having some museum person and a police officer, with the occasional military person to accompany. Wow. Now there could be an excuse for someone like Nick, due to his ties with his time-traveling wife, having value as a consultant. But none of these people should be anywhere in the field with such dangerous animals. Now something could be brushed off as just Lester's oversight of a team, just deciding he likes these amateurs or something. That's kind of what I assumed initially, but there isn't a point where it seems to be explicitly implied, and upper ranks seem to be aware of this anyway, so it's hard to discern why so much oversight. And later on in the series, around season 4 and 5, it eventually ends up in different hands, and they'd have a more professional mindset going forth, 
even declining Abby and Connor after they got back. Don't tell me you agreed to this. It was my idea. However, they eventually get reaccepted due to Abby being able to take care of animals within the enclosures and Connor being pretty wormhole experienced at this point. A good reason. But what do you know? They're both back on the field with everyone else. Now, outside of a relevance these characters should have in this environment, here's some thoughts on the actual merit of some of them. Nick Cutcher. He was the affirmative leader early on. Something evident about him is being stubborn, having rigid certainty at times to an irrational degree. Now, this kind of character could work really well with the right context. For example, there's an incident where Nick wanted to stay back in the Permian for a vague notion of finding his wife. On one hand, I'm appalled by the seeming stubbornness where he's gambling and staying in an unpredictable time zone with no way out. However, when considering Nick is dealing with a revelation of possibly finding his wife, coupling that with this insane scientific phenomena, it would make sense that in this situation, it would make a somewhat irrational man. Now, with that said, Nick's stubbornness doesn't always pay off. There's a similar scenario later on in the series, staying behind in the Cretaceous in the vague hope to change time. I'll get to that later. Also when it comes to the theories of wormholes, where they come off as very non-scientific. Some which get forgotten early on, like a theory with fault lines, and another where it predicts anomaly patterns through mythical sightings. Like, uh, like Chimera, um, Pegasus, the Yeti, the Hydra, Kraken, Captain Planet! Well, this turns out to be true. But there is no indication of whatever mythical conjuring is somehow based off a real creature or just based off imagination. Just that Nick somehow knows. Segwaying from the MacGuffinness of Nick, there is Helen, the lost time traveling wife. Earlier on, there are brief glimpses of her, indicating that at this point she now has some control. Then she and Nick eventually meet within episode 3. There, Reverend displays some grain emotion of reuniting with someone you haven't met in a while. Nick simply just chews out Helen. I get that she disappeared from his life with seemingly no explanation, but it was because of wormholes. I'd imagine there would be at least some utilization of understanding how the wormholes work with her. And if you're going with anger, at least show more of a rejoicing initially. I'm not buying these two ever being a thing. Earlier on, it seems most of the anger is unjustified, but later on, she turns out to be a total narc exposing her affair of Stefan, and maybe this sprag behavior is a consequence of her excessive time traveling, and with that comes probably the biggest missed opportunity in the show, an exploration of Helen's time traveling experience. Imagine what could be explored, what discoveries she made. She's went from tactical clothing, to evil dot, wanting to discover, to wanting to eliminate the human race. They're all sporadic story points, but they make sense with this kind of character, and it would have been intriguing to explore more with her. Now, one more character I'll mention within this mosh pit is Lake Connor Temple. I'll just say straight up, he's one of the few characters that I think I actually buy within the show, along with Cold Lester and some of the military people. He does a good job playing a nerdy character that borderlines cute and annoying. Earlier on, I'd say he was more annoying, in part because the writers seem to have trouble writing his kind of character. Who do you think would win in a fight between Wolverine and Spider-Man? Even responsible for some of the dumber things, like carelessly getting the ugly lizard loose. But later on, he seems more measured, reflecting a bit of his character growth, even eventually getting to Abby. A lot of this is also reinforced by Andrew Lee Potts' passion. He clearly has a lot of fun in this primeval franchise, appearing in all five seasons and being the Lincoln character in its spinoff. It's commendable. There are plenty of other characters to run down, Time is limited, so here's the ones I like, and the ones I'm kind of eh on. I guess one more titular character of note is Nigel Marvin. He was well known for the walking of specials, and makes an appearance here. He does his usual thing, gawk at animals, then a gigantic Giganotosaurus comes in and eats him. Well, we don't see it, it was off screen. Leaving it open, maybe Nigel went through the wormholes, gaining his own set of skills, leading to his walking with specials, and prehistoric park. Similar people involved, so confirmed, I guess. You've got to be careful. Are those formidable? Pincers at the front. Oh. The scorpion gave me a graphic demonstration of just how formidable its claws are. Ah! One other quick thing to comment about primeval characters here is the writing. 
I've been going over a lot of what is essentially just technical aspects, but the writing itself, it's, it's kind of a sledgehammer. A lot of stuff deeply explained for obvious. Just consider the subtlety in a scene. Listen to my voice. I said, jump. That means nothing to you, does it? You really had to say that? Like the actual demonstration of improve that otherwise? There are also sequences where the physics don't make sense. Here's a scene to demonstrate. So outside of Lester not initially reacting, I guess because he's challenging and being badass. How did the mammoth come in so quickly? They showed it super slow-mo. It must have sprinted to hit the future monkey. This badass scene is coming at a cost. I could really go on, scene by scene, but I've demonstrated my point. Now I figure i talk about a particular story point of interest. So there's the character. Claudia Brown. She had an interesting chemistry with Nick. The episode before, she had a frightening encounter with pterosaurs. And in this episode, she has all these weird flashes of gorgonopsids and wormholes. At first, this seems like some weird, comical PTSD. Then Nick and Helen have a little excursion to wormhole. And after they come out, with Helen briefly revealing her relationship with Stefan, later leaving, Nick asks, Where's Claudia Brown? I don't know anyone of that name. Something's gone wrong. Something, something's happened. Something's changed. We've done something. We've... Something that we've done has changed the past, and she's not here anymore. Oh, my God. So the show immediately deals with bizarre time-changing stuff, where apparently leaving some baby future monkeys into Permian somehow altered the timeline, where Claudia Brown no longer exists, now replaced with Jenny Lewis, in the former amateurish facility is now a more professional arc. Now regardless of this detail from the past 200 million plus years ago, somehow affects the present, there can be a bit explored with how there's change. So the analysis. First, the arc change. Obviously, it's meant to give a little more legitimacy to the team, but the team still is amateurs. Ones that, from what we could tell, don't really have any altered origins with exception of Claudia and their amateurness still shows. As within the first episode, Connor ends up accidentally shooting at me, and there's a point where they grab the pole sticks to fight off the Donaticus. Yeah, they still suck. Like, how do they even get involved in a government facility like this? It's clear the technolized change is meant to legitimize the team, but still keeping the nature of the characters because don't want to change too much, I guess. Then there's the shift to Claudia, which is clearly meant to screw with Nick, and does so indeed, Though this Jenny's now a more whiny character. Also, she was never properly informed this place is about wormholes into animals. Again, shown your professionalism arc. Also, the Jenny character eventually goes back to some more Claudia-esque aspects, probably because the wardrobe was too much. Eventually, a lot of this stuff gets minimized to forgotten later on. Also, it's fair to note that these are the only two changes within this time shift. As stated, the rest of the characters are still the same, and admittedly, while this time warp was frustrating, it did show potential. Think of all the implications that could happen with every single time traveling stride. Where every time they go back, they could risk changing something significant later on. Imagine every few episodes where the status quo suddenly changes, where characters change positions from professional to minute. Maybe they learn this only happens with certain wormholes. A lot could be explored, but clearly, they don't want to open this Pandora's box too long creating more confusion or questions. I will say with all this, Nick's death did have some poignancy, being a relief from all the confusion. Tell Claudia Brown. Never mind. Wow, that sucked. Also, really quick touching on cliffhangers, they generally suck overall. A reminder that TV has this continuous format that never seems to end, unlike movies where the advocacy is to end, in a strong stigma against sequels. There's a reason Breaking Bad resonates to this day. The creators call an ending, and it works. Anyway, back with Primeval. There's the first season cliffhanger, with Claudia Brown suddenly disappearing. A frustrating one, 
but admittedly unique. The second one ended with Helen looking evil, but it's revealed she has clones. Ooh. A fair enough teaser. The story ends are still tied up. And Helen is still out there, this time with a new toy. Unnecessary, but fine. Then we have a cliffhanger from season three, which oh boy. So there's a goose chase where Connor, Abby, and the current leader, Danny, are all following Helen through a series of wormholes, preventing her from wiping out the human race. They go through the future, Cretaceous, and then the Pliocene. Helen takes her swing, but ends up killed by a stupid dromaeosaur. The humans are saved, and the Helen story is finally resolved. But what's this? Donnie is left in the Pliocene, Connor and Abby are in the Cretaceous, and the rest are seeing if they could rescue them from the future. Wow, that's a lot of cogs to leave off on. And in the nature of a show's jarring cliffhangers, I'm gonna leave it here. Next part I'll finish up the story stuff, and then the animals. Stay tuned. And then it gets cancelled. Actually, the series did get cancelled around this time. And boy, this is an awful place to leave off on. And you know, this is why I keep saying cliffhangers suck. Also, personal anecdote, I actually remember getting into the series right after the season. But it's okay, because I then learned the show's been renewed with two new seasons coming out. Relatively back to back. Hi, guys. Anjali Potts here. Um... I just want to say thank you so much for your awesome enthusiasm for the show. Without you, we wouldn't be back. So we're totally excited about the new season. Um, and hopefully you're going to love it. Get ready for the wildest ride yet. Ah, uh, never change Lee Potts. Now, despite the show's revival with 13 new episodes, it suffered from the hiatus being cancelled. And unlike other shows that have been able to come back from cancellation as if nothing has happened, a lot has changed. Sarah didn't come back due to family obligations, so they decided she died off screen. Also, Danny couldn't return as a regular, so he had his guest episode and then left. To be fair, characters not returning to the show due to actors is not that rare. You think Nick was axed off a show because it was a creative decision? Actors ditching this show at a fascinating rate. There's also the aesthetic changes, with the arc now being more close quarters, darker and cheap. The animals in general look and act different due to shifts in animation companies. Anyway, gang for cliffhanger. For season four, there's a teaser not to trust Philip and Connor getting into his car. Basic tea stuff as usual. The next series comes out soon anyway. Then there's the final episode of the final season. They stop the super wormhole. Everyone on the team has somebody, except for Lester. Connor proposes to Abby, and they happily do their usual animal stopping thing. All's well. Then what's this? Matt, the future character who was here to stop the impending doom, suddenly sees a conspicuous visitor delivering a warning. Go back. You have to go back. Nothing. More future Matt. Wow. They could have shown any other dapper future character just within the current team. Imagine seeing Helen or Nick, or if they needed an actor that was available, and not to be confused with other teammates. Well, you did have Jenny return. Imagine if you had that actor coming in at the end, saying some stuff like, save your timeline, don't end up like me. It'll end up making even less sense than the current, but it would have at least been more interesting. But none of that matters, because the show is finally cancelled. Honestly, good. This is a good place to end. Everything is resolved, people are happy, and it ends in a pointless cliffhanger we could all ignore. The way I see it, we could just accept the show's ended, and assume the characters are living happily ever after fighting animals. Or if you want a cynic's ending, then the doomed future Matt warned against comes to fruition. Maybe through a hypothetical I suggested earlier like a vacuum caused by a wormhole to space, or everyone gets cancer. Now, of course, there was the final strike with the attempt of a spinoff. 
Got no intent in seeing it. The only connection for OJ original I know is Connor makes an appearance. Something I will say is that in traditional primeval fashion, it ends in a cliffhanger. Where after killing off an Albertosaurus, wormholes start closing. Uh oh, something's wrong. Man. Anyway, I've prolonged long enough. This is what you're here for, what I want to talk about. It's Los Animals. Now something I mentioned earlier is that one of the creators was involved with Walking With series. And while it's hard to know how much of an influence he had on this show, due to having more onset people, it is clear to say he at least had influence on the animals. A sizable proportion of them in Primeval are indicative of the ones portrayed in the Walking With series. Some of them adopting some of the specific traits within Walking With, like the cutesy Diectodon and the Behemoth Liplorodon. The first season even made a point of not showing any dinosaurs minus the avians, reflecting the ambition of a former show. Granted, the prehistoric animals aren't just a walking with tribute, as there are different aesthetic choices in terms of which animals are utilized more. For example, there are a predominance of dromaeosaurs within Primeval, whereas they have a relatively small presence within the walking whiffs. There is also the general accuracy within the two. Admittedly, the walking with series isn't known for its stark accuracy. Primeval, however, does away with all that, being excessively exaggerated. Now I'll admit, I'm generally not a stickler for accuracy if it's coming from a totally fictionalized product. Part of the premise is people meeting these dinosaurs IRL. In a way, part of the point of the show is that we are mainly just seeing these animals that we only know of through fossilized remains. There was a joke where Helen Cutter was talking about Utah raptors in the Jurassic. That could have been seen as a blatant inaccuracy. But I honestly saw as a bit of a quip as, what well, you guys don't know. For all we know, maybe there is a Utah raptor in the Jurassic. We just haven't found the bones yet. In all honesty, I'm fine with Primeval being loose. To be frank, a smaller inaccuracy from Walking With bugs me way more. Just because that series is presented like a documentary, and they are kinda meant to know better. With all that said, an issue that I do have with Primeval's exaggerations, with past and present animals, is when they're exaggerated a certain way. With all the portrayals, it's always make the animals look bigger, fiercer, specifically scarier. Again, tying into the, we need to make them cooler factor. I recall the Smile Dawn episode, where it didn't even come in a wormhole. It just grew up from when it was a cup. It's like any other case when someone raises a big cat. Yet this guy's treated as bigger, nastier. Also, in what world would you need to fight a big cat with a crane? There's also the collection of animals at the end of season 2, containing the most ravenous animals that aren't even any bigger than a hippo. Oh, and part of his setup is that they were going to be used like weapons. Helen talked about somehow using the animals to change the timeline, but nothing's really specified. I could just tell they really wanted an excuse to use them animals. And on the subject of the people interacting with the animals, well, there's just the overall believability. Most of these animals look fake, in part due to TV CGI, though they eventually do get a little better later on. Anyway, the moments when they are least believable is when they're interacting with real life things, specifically humans, two different planes, one of real, one that isn't, a smidge of a disconnect. Funny enough, when the animals are at their best, it's easily when they're clashing with each other. A prime example is the Gorgonopsid Future Monkey Clash, where they engage in a high-speed smackdown. It's easy to believe in both hitting each other, because they are both computer generated graphic, and the impact between them is damn believable. This is easily the best scene within the entire show. It makes me want more. Despite the array of animals, the series doesn't take many opportunities to let them clash. In some ways, they are limited with how much they could show due to budget. This makes me think, whatever methods they could use to bring the animals to life. There were some puppets within season 1, but I get it's hard to use, especially if you want fast moving animals. Maybe this is personal experience, but why not stop motion? I've been able to pull some off, using the most bare minimal materials in Movie Maker. I get the whole uncanny valley, and how it could probably turn people away. But who says it has to be for all animals? There could be one or two that are like stop motion specific. This is probably just me. Now getting to be animal specific. First, let's talk about that ugly lizard thing. Rex. Immediate ding. He does not act like a lizard at all. All this moving and noise he's making. He comes off as very mammalian. Q. 
cutesy up for the audience. Which, to be frank, is distracting, and I'm not buying. Just think back to when you go to a pet store or zoo. Are you glad I'm home? Huh? Are you glad I'm home? Huh? Are ya? Are ya? Later on in the series, when they introduce another little critter from the Permian, they also display some of the similar mammalian esque traits, and it works due to having more mammalian features, which blend better with the characteristics. Nothing much else to say. Sometimes Rex is taken hostage for some reason. Kind of feel bad, I guess. Moving on. There's the OJ original creatures in the series, being the future monkeys, a prominent animal featured within the show. They establish it to be some distant relative of Bat as a sort of cool reveal of this insane monster being of such a minuscule animal, and tying into the whole echolocation factor, though there are moments when it's inconsistent with its use. Also the design's interesting, utilizing a monkey-like aesthetic in the eyeless face, though the faceless face is basically from Alien, from Alien. I will say as far as conceptions for future animals go, it didn't have much relation to a bat other than its vague echolocation. I don't know. Would have been cool to design an animal based on how more of its traits could carry over, rather than make it cooler. Also, I swear, there is a point where they say this thing is like as smart as a human. It has human levels of intelligence and an almost supernatural ability to stalk its prey. I mean, primeval. If you want to make your ultimate super monkey, at least be honest and consistent about it, for the love of. My biggest complaint is how much they fall back on it. There are so many other animals to explore. I guess because they think, oh man, look how cool and original it is. I know, they want to make this the ultimate predator. Then there be the raptors, who are also damn prevalent, and have an interesting feather-like design. My main complaint is simply how stupidly they get killed, often just jump into their own deaths. Come on, no one wants to die. At this point, I've covered a lot of my points. Also, as far as the show ever coming back from cancellation, the main series got closure, and I'd say put it to rest. Still, I'd say there is definitely room for another kind of time-traveling series. While the show is quite faulty, it did get me to do a lot of thinking of how I could tell an insanely dynamic time-traveling story, or possibly series. I'll think of adding it for personal pitches to explore new animals, both past and present. Who knows?